Oceans and their currents are the life support of all living beings on Earth. The Benguela upwelling system off Namibia's Atlantic coastline is one of the most productive fishing grounds in the world. Ensuring a healthy Benguela current marine ecosystem is the key to success of all life in Namibia. A lack of awareness and understanding of Namibia's marine resource management may result in an unfavorable public perception of the predominantly good and positive strides made in protecting the sustainability of marine ecosystem resources. Why is it that the science of climate change and its direct effect on Namibia's marine resources is largely unknown and unexplained to most. These are the voices taking us on a journey into the Benguela current large marine ecosystem. A question leads to a question. Uh, that's the nature of science. Um, but we, we continuously have to monitor what we are doing now whether it is adequate to the status of the resources today. So that in itself means the question is, are we doing what we're doing currently? Is it um, protecting and ensuring the sustainability of the resources or the social benefit from those resources? So that will always be the question. There is so much we don't know in the ocean. And, and I mean, if we, we don't even know much about the rocky shore, so just imagine the deep oceans. There's lots of opportunities, scientific opportunities that will contribute in this regard that, that could be zoned in on this preserving a healthy ecosystem and managing the Benguela current for that matter as an ecosystem. Well, our marine resources are very important for every individual, and I'm not talking about fish here. Fish, of course, we all we can eat, but every marine animal is part of the ecosystem and has a function. And some things that many people probably don't know is that phytoplankton, that's the little plants in the sea, that they produce more than 50% of the world's oxygen. So if we pollute our ocean, it might lead to a temporary increase of phytoplankton, but it might lead to species that produce less and imbalance the system. So that is important why we keep our oceans clean, because it's not only the food we eat, it, it drives the entire Earth climate. You need to understand how the species live, where it is, then you go uh, and collect your data. We have to go to board the vessel in Warpest Bay, go out to sea, bring it back here, the data. And then we look at that data now on a scientific basis, analyze it, interpret it, and put it in paper now where we, are, we can comment to the uh, or either to the council or to the minister or to the fisheries management committee and also to the public, we can publish it. We are internationally recognized um, as one of the leading operators in seafood production and we want to build on that and it's something we want to change this perception of this, the negativity that's in general around the fishing industry. Namibia's Benguela system supports rich fish stocks of sardines, anchovies, horse mackerel, other small pelagic fish, as well as zooplankton and crustaceans. Among the most abundant species are anchovies and pilchards, which suffered from intense overfishing during the 1950s to 1970s. These now largely depleted populations in turn need to support a large biomass of larger fish, seabirds and marine mammals. Can the ecosystem be supported to ensure their full recovery? The part of the ocean that is the, wa in the, that is the water, that's, that would be pelagic. And um, the, it's actually, all fish are actually dwelling within the pelagic zone. If you are standing on a beach and you look um, horizontally across the, over the ocean, 
you would be looking over a pelagic zone, but the immediate zone would be what they would call the neretic zone. So that is about from the shore to where the water is 200 meter horizontally into the ocean. And beyond that, there will be oceanic zone. But you can, one can look at it also vertically from the surface to about where the water is 200 meter depth, that would be epipelagic zone. And below 200 to 400 meter, that will be mesopelagic. 400 to 1,000 meter, that would be uh, benthopelagic. And below that, four, from 4,000 deeper, that would be uh, apis uh, pelagic. So that's the deep of the deep. But the only zone that you can separate from pelagic would be the demersal zone or the benthic zone, which is basically the bottom part of the ocean where some species also dwell and bury themselves within the, um, the mud on the bottom. The species that we find, so basically all the species, uh, fish species are within these zones. Uh, within the epipelagic zones, that would be the sardine, the, horse, the, the anchovy, the round herrings, those are the common species that we get here. As you go deeper into the mesopelagic, you will be talking about the horse mackerel, which is probably the most popular at, at the moment. And uh, deeper than that would be um, lantern fish and so in the mesopelagic zone. But species as sharks, um, angling species, the snook, the couple yo, those are also dwelling within the epipelagic. That's where, that's where they feed. Seals feed within the epipelagic zone. Whales and dolphins also feed in the same zone. The Benguela Marine Ecosystem is one of the most productive coastal upwelling zones in the global oceans. The high levels of primary productivity of the Benguela Ecosystem supports an important global reservoir of demersal biodiversity. What are the methods used to preserve the state of marine resources? We've got the big um, Beguela current large marine ecosystem here, which basically goes from Angola to the southern tip and a bit around South Africa, where the other big currents sort of get onto or, or touch that system. So that's then the end. Then you will have different organisms, you've got a different temperature re regime, different oxygen. So an ecosystem is, is one big system that is bordering other systems, but it, it does exchange, especially in the marine world. It's not like a box, it moves with seasonality, with winds, with currents, but it's one system where everything functions and, and has a role, and it needs to function to continue. The mesa refers to either close or on the bottom, and in this case we refer to the sea. It's, so it's those resources of fish stocks that live very close or on the bottom of the ocean. And it can be as deep from, it can be as close as here, as long as it's on the bottom, all the way to 4,000 meters, so to say, yes. The, the Mesa ones, are, as I mentioned, are the Hague, the Monk, all those are deep. They are deep, you cannot uh, catch them here unless they walk out <laughs> due to some environmental conditions. And, uh, but the rock lobster is not far. It's on the bottom in the rock, but it's, it's here. You can get it by diving. For any commercial activities for, with marine resources, you need a a type of permit, there are different types. And I think that's important to know, and I think that's something not many people know. I mean, mussels, you're not supposed to collect mussels and sell them, because then you will also collect more than the 50 per day, because you can only consume so many. And, and I think that's very important for the public to understand, because they always, I have lots of discussion also with kids. What's the difference if I, you know, if I'm allowed to take seven a day, if I sell them or not? It's the, you know, the idea is that you will only collect limited amounts for own consumption. So when it comes to demersal resources, we have, I can say we have two. The monkfish and the deep sea red crab. Those are in good condition so far. They are more or less where we want them to be at Biomass at the maximum sustainability. For other stocks, it's not so much good news. For hake, it's not yet there. 
We have been trying to get it there since independence in 1990, where it was very, very bad. We have been trying to get it there, but it's still not yet there. We have been rebuilding it for a long time now. Orange Rafi, bad. I think we all know that there was a moratorium since 2008. Uh, we are now trying to do our surveys and our stock assessment to make sure, to see if it has recovered. Then it can be opened up again for fishing. Rock lobster, it's also not in good condition, so to say. This is a resource that used to give about 9,000 tons a year in the 1960s, 1970s. But as we speak, the catches are around 200 tons. We just have to be very careful on, on what to do with this resource. In 2013, the governments of Namibia, Angola and South Africa signed the Benguela Current Convention, an environmental treaty that established the Benguela Current Commission to ensure sustainable use of the productive but vulnerable shared marine resources and to monitor the marine environmental biodiversity and ecosystem health. How can fisheries management measures ensure a healthy marine ecosystem? Okay, the Benguela Current Convention, that's the BCC, it's, it's a convention that is signed between South Africa, Namibia and Angola, and that is to, to have a joint management on shared resources in the Benguela Rojas marine ecosystem. Countries or fish have, and resources do not or doesn't know boundaries, but but there are, we are shared some of those resources. For example, hike we sell seals, lobsters. There's a lot of resources that are shared among the three countries, and BCC was established to to do joint management on these resources. Now, the fisheries we we cluster and group the large scale fisheries, the commercial fisheries, the small scale fishermen, uh, community based and also mariculture into fisheries. And the objective of this project, national and regional, is to build resilience. 40 years of information that we have collected, and that's the basis on which decisions are made. Every time that we make it an advice to government, we have to reflect over those years as to whether that um, actually reflects on the growth and the development of the stock. So that gives us an idea what should be a healthy state in, the, in our ecosystem. TIC means total allowable catches. It's basically a limiting uh, amount that we recommend as scientists and the minister has to set for the year that that is what can be caught based on the status of the stock, on the biological sustainability of the stock. So it's a limiting factor so that the fish do not get depleted. We do surveys, scientific surveys, uh, that we collect on our boats, our scientific research vessels. We go to sea and we measure the quantity, how much fish is there in the water, by using instruments or techniques uh, that help us to quantify the volumes. And uh, that helps us to inform our manager how much fish is out there at a given time. We are con constantly um, monitoring what's happening with the product. I mean, sizes. Every fish that gets landed by us gets graded into nine or ten different sizes. So we know exactly if there are trends of smaller, larger, medium fish. Um, because it affects our markets, we have, we have products for every different size of fish. One fish, a large fish, can be cut up into three or four different parts that go into three or four different countries. That's how extensive we, our, our planning is. I work, we as Namibia, not me personally, on, on a blue economy policy because the, the marine spatial planning is identified as a tool to achieve the blue economy. And it's actually international, it's a huge thing, the marine spatial planning. And, and Namibia is, is really on the forefront. You know, we just launched a, a MSP guide through IOC UNESCO where Namibian examples are in the international guide. I think it's a very, very 
successful story that Namibia has built up. Factories are standing there, people are there. Uh, this job just needs to be maintained as long as the resource exists. Namibia's coastal desert originates from strong prevailing southwesterly winds blowing inland beneath warmer air layers. The resultant upwelling of the nutrient-rich Benguela current provides resident coastal communities with an essential source of livelihood by means of artisanal fishing. This plankton-rich current provides a valuable and much sought-after marine resource in the form of line fish, which should be valued, treated and marketed on the same economic level as rock lobster. Various sources of evidence suggest that this marine and coastal system and its scarce line fish resource, which mostly occurs close to shore and out of the reach of commercial fishers and trawlers, is under pressure by anglers, in addition to experiencing significant climate variability and environmental changes. How can the economic value of this important resource be protected to secure further opportunities for long-term sustainability? COP at the moment are not in a very good state. Uh, they, are, they have been under moratorium now since 2008 because the catches are low. What we do is we interview the anglers continuously um, or frequently uh, while they are busy on the beach and we sort of ask them on what they are catching, how long they've been on the beach and that helps us to see the effort or the efficiency of fishing at any given time. So COP is not in a very good state. Uh, if you take Halyun, probably better but it's also not very good. So most of the lionfish species are not in a good state as we speak. We are currently reviewing um, our assessment or updating uh, our assessment to see whether the information that we have gathered now uh, actually still speaks to the measures that we have put in place. And if we see that um, the situation is worse than it was about 10, 10, 10, 15 years ago, we will have to review those measures. Basically what it means is that uh, for an angler, he would have fewer fish to catch. Climate change-induced environmental issues place marine resources under additional pressure and hamper development and the quality of life of many Namibian citizens. Is there a noticeable impact of climate variability on Namibia's marine resources? Now, with the complexity of climate change, there are always new questions. What is the impact of increased carbon dioxide in the water, for instance? Does it um, makes the fish more vulnerable to the environment? Are there food available to the fish and all that? Also, the human activities that we undertake in the water. With the new exploration of all sorts of mining and, and oil drilling, what are those factors uh, contributing to the well-being of the resources? We know that climate change is in fact and we do see the effects on the resources and hence it is important to build resilience to ensure that there are alternative livelihoods if something happens to a resource. Be it at the community level, be that in a mariculture venture or in a large-scale fisheries operation. Well, upwelling is basically what drives our system here. So it's the wind that's coming from the south and it blows the surface water to the north. And because of the earth rotation, the surface water is then diverted offshore and is replaced by cold, nutrient-rich waters from the deep sea. That's why our system is so productive, or was so productive, if we think of the fish catches, the pelagic catches in the 60s, with catches of over a million tons. Food change starts with wind. So uh, wind drives the upwelling system. The upwelling system feeds the plankton, and that is what our oysters eat. Valfus sits in the middle of the low oxygen area, the natural low oxygen area, while Luderitz is in the middle of the upwelling cell, which 
constantly replenishes the oxygenated water from the deeper waters. So they get their constant supply of fresh water from the deep ocean, while in Valfus Bay it's much calmer, and especially in the bay. And there's much more primary production that rots, leading to these sulfur eruptions. Uh, Walbush Bay farmers, for instance, are affected by sulfur eruptions and uh, red tides. So when they have these bad times, we, they prefer to keep stocks in Ludwitz. But eventually when weather is good again and these crises are over, then uh, they take their stocks again. So definitely our core business is the weather problem. And a big problem I have on Mercury is, is the heat. You know, we've, I record more and more days where the temperature is above 25 degrees and a, a penguin cannot withstand that for, for extensive periods of time, for more than, than a few hours. And they have to go to sea. And then all the eggs and chicks are basically lost. With the kelp gulls take the eggs and the, the small chicks and the bigger chicks run away for shade because the parents are not there. And within a matter of a morning, a, a whole generation of penguins are just wiped out. The Namibian Islands Marine Protected Area, NIMPA, stretches for 400 kilometers along the coast north and south of Luderitz and 30 kilometers offshore. It protects the marine environment of 10 small islands and 8 islets and rocks used by seabirds as breeding sites. What is the overall significance of these islands to the marine ecosystem? I've been on working for the Ministry of Fisheries on Mercury Island, which is it resorts under the seabird and island section. And I've been there for 26 years. It's, it's a world record <laughs> and it will be for, I think, all time to come. But uh, it's one of the th three manned islands along this coast. There's, there's plenty of islands, but we have only three manned ones and uh, it's Possession Island in the south and then to the north we have Ichibu Island and, um, and then Mercury Island which is about eight hours by boat to get there. Uh, so it's a two-day trip coming and going. It's a, it's a small little, it's a three hectare rock basically. Island gives a, the word island gives a wrong impression. It's just a three hectare rock. But it holds quite some records in the bird world and, uh, and the benefit to fisheries, the main purpose of including the islands and so on, is basically the management of the whole Benguela current system. And having the islands, which is very special ecosystems on their own, they are also beautiful indicators if you monitor them and widespread like they are. So, yeah, indicators regarding the, the health of the Benguela current. And, and we use the seabirds basically as data points for that. If, and and the, putting it simple, if it's not going well with the birds, it's not going well with the Benguela current. So it's just one of the indicators. And Mercury Island, it's got 72% of the global population of bank cormorants, for instance. And uh, well, 81% of the local population. So you can imagine just, it, just a small oil spill close to their feeding grounds or whatever, and that species is basically gone. And the same, it, it's got the second biggest gannet population in Namibia and the biggest penguin population for Namibia. So it's a very special rock and very close to my heart. Yes, and of course, these birds, like the gannets, are, are critically endangered. The others, four main species, uh, which is the penguins, crown, uh, bank cormorants, cape cormorants, they are endangered, they are all endangered. Apart from using them as to gauge the wealth of the system, we also do all kinds of projects on the birds themselves to figure out what's going on with them and to read the signs and to, to extrapolate where everything is going.
Namibia ranks among the top 10 fish-producing nations globally. The nutrient-rich Benguela upwelling system, with its high primary productivity, is considered a major environmental asset which creates ideal conditions for sustainable economic development. How can the marine environment be preserved for sustainable socio-economic development? It's basically unlocking the economic potential of the ocean, but the blue economy is it must be sustainable. Environmental sustainability is a huge, huge um, focus in the blue economy. It's actually environmental sustainability, social equity and inclusiveness, I think, are the three. So it's to optimize the economic benefits of the ocean without destroying it. And also not only for certain individuals, but for Namibia as a whole. There's a lot of data that gets captured also on the, the quality of fish, the temperature of the water. Um, we need to also being IFS certified, um, which is international food standards, we need to be able to trace a problem back to the day the fish was caught. So there's a lot of data that gets captured basically. So for example, if there's a funny parasite or something that ends up in a customer in Monaco, we need to be able to get, trace it back to the day it was caught, by what vessel. So data capturing and, and research is, is ongoing but more on a product development side, but indirectly there's a lot of data that also is a spin-off that shows um, environmental indicators that we also then feed back to ministries or whatever platforms there are where we, if we do have concerns, we try and share those. We collect samples also from the industry. When they go out fishing, they come back with the fish and what they have loaded at the factories, they send us uh, samples and that help us to see the sizes of the fish, the type of fish that they see, and uh, that help us to understand whether we are seeing a range of sizes, because that's what we want to see in a healthy population. We don't want to see one class or one group, only small fish or big fish, because the big fish should be giving birth to small fish, so both must be present in the population. In the grand scheme of things, we are a significant contributor to, to a the Namibian local economy. And this is not just directly, but also indirectly with all the work we provide here. Um, we operate transparently, openly. You know, we see ourselves as an industry leader. So these, these catches, catches are by, on a trip basis. So there is communication and reporting on a, on a, on a trip by trip basis. And then there's more formal, a sort of holistic and overview and like I mentioned previously, the production and the catches and tallying up sort of what happens in a quarter um, value addition wise and input output wise, um, that gets communicated quarterly. Namibia's fishing industry is well known for its world class capabilities in handling packaging, distributing, and marketing its marine products. Are there mechanisms in place to monitor the industry effectively? Fisheries inspectors are not on board all the time. There are fisheries observers who are on board on each, uh, on each vessel. But the inspectors do go uh, for routine inspections uh, to see. They board the vessels, they check the net, they check the areas where you are fishing, but there is also a system called vessel monitoring system, which is here. All the vessels are being monitored. If you encroach on the area where you are not supposed to be, it's being monitored and you can be heavily punished uh, in that regard. A bycatch levy, it's a levy on bycatches. That if you catch them, you are going to pay a certain amount. Uh, in that way, it's to deter and to, to try to encourage them to avoid not catching. So the majority of the hag we catch is, is trawling. Um, the TAC of the, I guess it's 146,000 metric tons for the year, of, of which basically 90% gets, gets caught by trawling. Um, and that is, that is bottom trawling. Um, so it's big nets that go out at the back and the gear is very 
I mean, it, it depends on because it, it gets quite technical, but how big those your nets um, holes are for smaller fish to get out. So that is all, you know, how much of it that dictates how much actually bycatch you catch or how small the fish is that you catch. And, and then also how much drag is behind the vessel. So the, your gear could result in you actually burning excessive fuel because it takes so much effort to drag it out again or to drag it behind the vessel. So gear plays a big role and as I've mentioned previously also in terms of damage to the, to the ocean floor if it's not rigged correctly. Um, there's a lot of signs. I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. Every vessel is different. And I think just as an operator, we have a responsibility to, to ensure based on a catch basis, how you are performing and are you doing ethically the right thing um, by what you're landing in your net? Shouldn't you be um, challenging yourself if you are catching, if you are ending up with coral in your net, for example, is that not something you should be addressing? And that has been a problem in the past with operators down the road. And um, so I think we have a massive responsibility also to future generations to, to address this. Um, so it doesn't help we eat this pie today and we have nothing for tomorrow. And um, we need to make sure that we, we leave our mark and as a, as a respect to future generations and also to the ecosystem at large, because we are only a small part of this ecosystem. An ocean literate person is able to understand the importance of the ocean for humankind, is able to communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way, and has a more responsible and informed behavior towards the ocean and its resources. How can young Namibians be inspired to address the environmental and ecological sustainability of the oceans through their career and life choices? Ocean literacy, it's a study about ocean uh, so that we can conserve it. It's for conservation purpose that we enhance the learners so that they should understand completely that the ocean needs to be conserved and the resources within the ocean needs to be sustainably utilized. You know, there's a lot that your child can, le can learn outside the four walls of your house, but we feel that the education process starts with everybody that is connected to us. So we feel we have a responsibility in-house to make sure our people are skilled, our people know why they are doing things and what the impact of, of their, their doings are. So in many instances, it's, a, it's an education process um, and it's an education process that you make sure starts at home. And it rubs off on, on the industry because we are, a, as a sea work um, basically, operates and catches or lands and works about 15% of the, of the Hague resource. And that is a big chunk. And if we can convince our competitors to do something right that they might maybe are doing wrong, then we've already done quite a big thing in the big scheme of things. So there are formal, formal ways of reporting as required, um, but we also feel that we are quite influential in in setting trends um, that have an impact on making sure future generations are educated and know, know that it's important that we protect our resource. We really want to grow the education center. Um, I think there's a lot to learn and a lot that people don't know about animals that they can see from their coast. You mean you walk down the beach and you'll see bottlenose dolphins and then it's an incredibly abundant ecosystem. You got there, I mean you saw the hundreds of thousands of cormorants out there today, dolphins everywhere. I mean, we came back on the boat the other day and it was just like whale, 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 whale. You can go out on days and there's 15 boats, inboards, outboards, like loud engines. Um, you do get dolphins that are boat happy. They'll come, they'll jump, they'll play. The heavy sides are, can be very playful, but you don't notice are the individuals in the back, the mothers and calves, the older individuals who don't like boat interactions as much. Um, 
So kind of explaining that to them, maybe keeping, you know, keeping a little bit of distance, don't stay with groups too long. If you see their behavior change or they're trying to rest, respect that. Um, the other day there was a mother and a very small calf humpback whale out there. So I called on the radio and I said, hey, it's a mom and a calf. Try and approach slowly. Don't stay around too long. Maybe like let one or two boats in at a time and then just take turns. And they're all very good about respecting that. They appreciate the wildlife as much as we do. A forward-looking approach towards management of ecosystems that support all marine and aquatic activities is required to embrace a healthy ocean ecosystem as a growth opportunity for all future Namibians. How can a new generation of young scientists be nurtured to fill the growing need for marine ecosystem knowledge? The potential is high and people realize more and more that uh, you cannot only fish in the sea, you also have to farm in the sea and produce your own. For students and so on who are interested, you know, there's, there's lots of work around Ludritz. Um, we've got these two islands as well. They are monitored once a month. They are counted. There's work that could be done there. There's Halifax Island with quite a good penguin population. So it's, it's nice if you, if you enjoy working with nature and in nature. Spend time in the marine environment, get to know your marine environment because there you develop your interest and you see yourself how you fit into the system. And once you have that sort of natural relationship with the environment, you understand better what you want to, want to study and how you want to interact with the system. And that gives you the basis why you want to protect it because then you know the importance of the system and how it can be part of our life for a much longer time. Our task today is to protect it that also the coming generations can as well have a part or be part of this ecosystem. And it's important can never be overemphasized. It regulates our life in terms of supply of resources to, to our life. Fish is probably the only um, protein source that will be, in a longer sense, be more sustainable for our, for our existence. And it's, uh, it supply all the crop production that we have on, in our system. So we depend heavily on the ocean for transportation. We need to protect the oceans because the oceans are basically the drivers of the, of the world. There's so much more space to pursue careers and to investigate and to do good science on, on what is lacking and, and the opportunities are there. It's... Get kids interested in, in science at a young age. Um, uh, stop letting your children sit in front of the computers and in front of the television and get them out there. Let them experience the world, the environment. Um, I think that's the best way to get a kid interested in science. At least that's how I got interested in, in, for example, the ocean. I was constantly at the beach, I was constantly in the water, and yes, so I just wanted to know more, more detail.